I'm going to talk about uh, a paper that we titled Gone with the Wind International Migration, so there could be a lot behind that title. Uh, and this is joint work with our uh, former student of mine, Amelia Aburn, who's now at, Vic, uh, at uh, Victoria University in Wellington. So um, here are some numbers that we all know showing that migration is large, showing that migration is important, showing that we should care about migration, which uh, I think in this audience is not something that I need to defend. Um, also that migration will increase, and I put a conservative forecast here of the stock uh, of migrants and about 400 million by 2050. Conservative because the point of the paper is trying to make that climate change is a big driving force. And the forecasts of uh, climate migrants reach something from 200 million to a billion. So if you add that onto that, then the number gets larger. That's why this forecast uh, is rather conservative. So what are we doing here in this paper? So I want to think about this in two steps. In the first step, what I want to do is I want to offer a joint analysis. A joint analysis in the terms of economic driving forces of migration, climatic driving forces of migration, and political driving forces of migration. Combine those together. And the important thing is to have a combination of year-to-year -year variations of migration flows and of long-term. So a panel structure with large N, with large T, through year-to-year -year variations. Then, once we have this panel, once we run all our models and we identify those variables that are key to driving or explaining migration flows, then, in step two, we're going to plug them into a panel vector autoregressive model where the question is, if you have a shock to one of those driving forces, how will migration respond over time? Okay? So the question will be, if I see a disaster today, how will migration respond over time? And again, just to reiterate, what is this joint analysis that I'm talking about? Well, this joint analysis is, again, the economic factors, right differences in income, economic opportunities, unemployment, and so on. Political, the usual controls would be warfare, um, or terrorism for that matter. Um, we're going to add political freedom, the quality two measure that we heard about, and the climatic factors, disasters, weather and non-weather related disasters, and temperature trends. Um, I'm, I'm not going to justify or defend that there is climate change. If you believe that there is no climate change, then probably this paper is not going to give you a lot. Um, but the point is, we have climate change, we know that this will lead to already leads to changes in the natural system, and then through various channels, and this is just a subset of probably everything that goes on, um, this will have an effect on migration. Okay? And in this context, I'd like to think about migration as an adaptation strategy to this threat of uh, climate change. Now, what's the takeaway of this entire paper, if I don't make it through all the slides? Um, well, the takeaway is, the time dimension, this year-to-year -year variation is key, is key to understand the effects of climate change. And if we look at the, into the related literature, which normally uses decennial averages, decennial data, the results are either insignificant of weather-related temperatures or very small. And we find significant effects of very large effects. So this time dimension seems to be key. Climate change has, not in 20, 30, 50 years, large effects. It already has large effects today, which leads, if you believe the results, to migration. And something that was surprising was that the effect of climate change, temperature here, um, and, and weather-related disasters is even more important than income and political freedom at the origin. Okay? So that's, that's quite substantial and surprising. The effects of temperature are non-linear on certain variables. And if we then look into the dynamic uh, effects of this shock, uh, we find that the response varies quite a lot about the different categories of the shocks. 
uh, a brief literature review overview of the um, directly related literature, so this ignores um, single country studies, is those um, five papers which mainly find small effects or for the Bynum and Parsons paper, uh, hardly any significant effect at all. So, before we estimate something, I'd just like to have theory which explains what actually goes on, even if the model will be stylized, at least it gives us an idea uh, and, and fixes our thoughts. So we have a Bohas type model, and the development of that model, um, and the idea is to come up with an equation, and that will be the uh, bottom line here, um, that models migration flows between a host country I, a destination country J over time, and that is basically explained by the differences in income and then the difference in this <clears throat> A variable, which is all kinds of social benefits, okay? And those are related to political freedom, climate, and other socioeconomic factors, okay? And then you have to subtract the moving cost um, from moving from I to J, okay? And then there's a shock term. Now, if we then rewrite this theoretical equation, we have a gravity type equation that we can then estimate, okay? And this alpha term here will capture the original fixed effects um, as, as in the related literature. And then the migration decision, again, is driven by the differences in the benefits in the destination country relative to the origin country. Now, there are a lot of econometric issues here. I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, but what we end up doing is we have a baseline regression, which is all S, we're gonna <clears throat> use the PPML estimator as a control, and even the negative binomial regression estimator as a further robustness, because we believe that it is actually the more appropriate estimator uh, relative to the PPML, we over dispersion and excess zeros in the data. What's the data set that we construct? Well, we end up constructing this bilateral panel data set, which is fairly large, so we have 16 destination countries and we have the flow towards those 16 destination countries from about 200 countries. So this excludes basically really small countries, um, the Holy See, for example, um, so I think it's, it's pretty much the entire population. Period is 1980 to 2014, so that's 35 years. And those bold things over here just show you that the data set is very large. Okay, it's very large relative to the uh, published or related literature in the time dimension, in the um, panel dimension, and in T. What are the variables that we use? Well, the usual candidates, the usual suspects that you would like to have in this kind of augmented gravity model, migration costs, proxies by distance, and other socioeconomic um, uh, dummies, borders, language, alike, economic variables, income, proxy by GDP, uh, share of young population as a measure of labor market uh, chances, eight, agricultural land, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, political variables, the war dummy, uh, civil war or war between countries, and the political framework, the polity to um, measure. Climate variables, uh, temperature anomalies uh, on a country year basis and disasters from MDAT database in a weather and a non-weather category and that will be added to our regression model uh, step by step. So let, let's get a feeling for what kind of data we're dealing here uh, with. So this is a plot of disasters, total disasters in the sample over time. Uh, blue will be weather uh, related disasters and we see there's Okay, so in 1980, we had about 100 in total. Towards the end of the sample, it's more than 300. So it tripled over time. For non-weather uh, related disasters, that's pretty much flat. There is a spike, and that spike is epidemics um, around the um, early 2000s, but that's basically it. Okay? And that's what we would expect in climate change affecting weather related disasters, but not earthquakes and the like. Besides a first moment shift, um, there is also a higher moment shift. And 
here, this is a probably poor attempt to depict this, is uh, the distribution in 1980 of uh, disasters and 2014. And what we see is that this tail is just getting longer and longer and longer. So while in 1980, the highest a country could experience was 10 disasters, in 2014 it was more than 30. So it's not just increase in the mean, it is also increase in the distribution. So shift overall. Temperature, yep, we know that, um, is increasing over time. So 1980 was about the, bait, the bench line here, and since then it's basically upward trending um, over time. A bit of um, leveling up towards here, but 16 and, uh, 15 and 16 were rec record highs, so it's again uh, starting to increase. Countries are differently affected. There is, there is a, some, uh, a small group of countries that experience small increases in temperature, and there is a larger group of countries that experienced larger by about 0.8 degree uh, Celsius increases. So quite a, a variation across countries here. So let's look at the baseline model, very stylized MEDA type model. Um, and what we find is what basically the entire literature finds. So this shows that you know, um, the this, this stylized model is in line with different data sets. So, for example, if we increase GDP at destination by 10%, uh, migration would go up by about 10%. And this is robust across the OLS with fixed effects, the negative binomial, the PPML, different kinds of fixed effects. So, this is, we can take this to the bank, that this is a fairly uh, uh, robust finding. Now, it does get more interesting if we add all those additional variables and go to what we call joint analysis. Okay? So let's first think about what happens if we include wars and policy. Well, not much, only policy freedom at origin is significant. Okay? And this will increase migration flows. If we add climatic factors, temperature and weather-related disasters, we're here. Well, we migrate away from temperature into cooler countries and we migrate away from disasters. Okay. Now, what does this 0.03 mean? Well, that means that temp if temperature anomalies increase by 10%, then the migration would increase by about 3%, which is about 135,000 people per year. Okay. So that's roughly the uh, dimension that we're talking about. And then, yes, young population as well is significant, so we move away from countries with high competition towards country with less competition in the labor market. Now, you probably know, or have a lot of questions in your mind, is this really robust to whatever? Um, the answer is, well, it is certainly robust to all of this. And we've done a lot of robustness checks here with all kinds of things that came to our mind and the referees' minds, um, and the results are very robust. Okay? So you can't kill this, this temperature effect or the weather-related disaster effect. Briefly, there are nonlinear effects of climate change. So what we've done here is interacting temperature with the agricultural land share. So countries that rely more heavily on agriculture, when they experience higher temperatures, have stronger outward migration. Temperature and GDP, so you would expect that con richer countries, countries with a higher GDP, should have better mitigation strategies and therefore have lower migration. That's what we find. And finally, the interaction of temperatures and weather-related disasters is positive, so there is some correlation between um, the effects of climate change along temperature and weather-related disaster dimension, and so we would expect more migration out of that country. Now, finally, going into the dynamic effects of um, those shocks, we now know which um, variables are significant, and we're going to look at four different shocks. Income at destination, a war at origin, temperature at origin, disasters, weather-related weather disasters at origin. 
And this is going to be a P var X, so a panel vector order regressive model with exogenous variables. And this entire thing rests with um, our identification assumptions. Okay? So we have four variables that should identify those four shocks. Unemployment should identify the GDP shock. Okay? That's macro stylized literature. Epidemics might uh, be an instrument for war. Volcanic activity is an effect or is, is an IV for temperature. And my co-author actually has a BSc in biology, so unfortunately she's not here, so I'll have to tell you how this works. Um, apparently, volcanic activity has a trade-off between SO2 and CO2. SO2 rather cools, whereas CO2 rather increases temperature. So the aggregate effect is not really clear um, in the outcome. But in any case, it should be, it should be uh, a decent IV. And then finally, agricultural land should um, identify weather disaster shocks okay, through increased fertilizer usage and changes in the land use and the structures. So we plug that into the PVAR, run it through, and those are the impulse response functions. So we have percentage change on the vertical and years in the horizontal, and we have uh, about 90% confidence intervals here. Uh, if GDP at destination goes up, we have this expected increase over time, right? destination country becomes richer and migrants starts to get in, so full factor. If there's a war at origin, we see this increase over time. For weather-related disaster at origin, we have a bit of a surprise, at least to me. At the beginning, there's nothing, nothing significant. And then after about three, three and a half years, we have this increase in migration, which is fairly small relative to uh, the other variables. But the most interesting part here, at least for me, is the effect of temperature shocks. And that is a decrease on impact and then an overshooting, this would be an exchange rate, um, an overshooting of migration and a fairly persistent increase over time. So I want to understand this one a bit more closely. And this can can be done by combining two strands of the literature, really. So the first is Halliday, Piquet, and Catania and Perry, which basically say, well, they're binding liquidity constraints. If something bad happens, you can't just immediately sell off all your assets and move away. Okay? So it takes time to liquidate your assets, uh, make an informed decision through maybe social networks, um, and then move out of the the second explanation by uh, Dylan um, is spatial diversification. So you want to send out members of your household in different um, geographic areas to ensure against those temperature shocks. Problem is, with climate change, the risk probably goes up everywhere. So you have to send them out further. Sending people away further means higher migration costs. So you have to save for a longer period of time until you can actually make this migration decision happen. And this explains this initial lock-in where migration first goes down, and then over the saving, the relaxation of the uh, liquidity constraint, the binding constraint, migration will increase over time. So wrapping up, again, the two steps of this paper, joint analysis stressing the importance of the year-to-year -year variation and the long-run effects through a large N, large T type uh, panel, and then estimating the dynamic effects of those shocks to migrations. And as we would expect, there's a complex mix of driving forces. Climate change, as of today, is an important driving force, more important, again, than income and uh, political freedom at origin. And those shocks have very persistent effects. There's a short window of opportunity where we can limit the damage that has been done. Okay. And that can be done by a combination of short-run and long-run policies, but um, that has been published a lot. And, well, uh, finishing with this uh, change of one of the I guess, most famous quotes of movie history, um, that is me. Thanks. <laughs>